That's waiting on Betty. Well, don't wait on her. You have any food? No, I'm waiting on her to bring you food. Okay, well. You're like me. I don't want to hurt you. I don't need it. I was going to sit around on me. Here we go. Before I uh, before I introduce uh, the Reverend Doctor Matthew Grove Melton, <laughs> did you see this picture with like low that. tie? Uh, I, like <laughs> I think it's impressive. I, I never had it. I barely just I just barely got through seminary, I as we like, said. I, I, mean, I try. And I do know that. <laughs> so I found I was introduced to a book. It's called Every Moment Holy. It is one of the greatest books I've ever read. I was just introduced to it a few just a, a few weeks ago, and um, it has little, little, not little, but liturgies for everything you could ever imagine, including I got it so I can send the bishop a liturgy for beekeepers because he's a beekeeper. <laughs> However, in looking at it deeper than that, you know, instead of just sucking up to the bishop, I looked at it has, and then there's another one I have in there for funerals and for grief and for so it's remarkable and so we're going to use this book through Lent on Wednesdays and the first one we're going to use just so you're prepared is called a liturgy for those who have not done great things for God <laughs> maybe it worth fits maybe it doesn't however I, I want you to know this book is really tremendous and I thank you for buying it for me um, it, it's based on Philippians 2 do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves but each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others so it's, a, it's got petitions, intercessory prayers it's got everything in this thing it's not long but this is, we're going to use these and we'll choose one for every Sunday, every Wednesday of Lent so I just wanted you to know about it. It's called Every Moment. <laughs> so that's that. Um, Matt Melton, Dr. Reverend Doctor, um, <laughs> uh, serves as a spirit. Did you all read this about him? Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to then. The main thing, the main thing I want you to know is if you look in his Bible, I can tell a minister by the Bible. Uh, if you look at his Bible, and when he brings it, so he is in charge of the Hurricane Minister Alliance, as I told you. But he does other things. And we had a lunch the other day with all of the chaplains. But he, when you look at his Bible, if he opens it for you, it is marked, it is underlined, it is worn, it is everything that a man of God should do. And, I, and when I see somebody who gets up, and I see their Bible, I can tell. And Matt Melton's Bible is... Uh, is a, a Bible used by a man of God. It's a good book. It's a good book. Yeah. Yes, I get that. <laughs> he's, he, he's a real doctor. He's clever. He's just clever. I'm just barely getting by. So here's how I'd like to introduce him other than that. This is from a little snippet from the greatest preacher in the history of the world, Dr. W. Criswell, uh, as you know. And he wrote a little thing called Coronation Day, and I think it has to do with what Matt's going to at least I hope so. He writes, a dear sainted woman in our church died in the hospital from a terminal illness. The doctors had used chemicals, tubes, medicines, massages, and all of those apparatus appar to bring her back to life. When she came into consciousness for just a while, she exclaimed, oh, and now I must die again. Go ahead, have a seat. What a strange persuasion some have that when our life is done and our task is ended, then we are plunged into a terrible yonder, a horrible out there. If the human rangers can just delay by five more breaths our escape, then may all the signs of the physicians, the chemists, and the pharmacists be brought to bear that we may take these five more breaths. O oh Lord, no. When the task is done and the life is ended, the age is taking our faculties away, faculties away. It is a comfort to the Christian that he may be translated in victory and in triumph to an upper and more glorious world. 
joined to Christ in glory. Our translation is our coronation day. It is a great consummation for all which lies revealed will be moved. For those outside of the Lord, death is a blackness. It is a despair. It is a defeat. It is an awesome prospect. It is a death forever. But to the child of God joined to the body of Christ, death is a triumph. It is our ultimate victory. That someday all of us shall experience the joy. We cannot be lost. We belong to his body. We are members of his very frame. He lives, we also shall be saved and shall live with him. We cannot be lost. Christ does not lose part of his members. We are joined to him. That is the job, one of them, that Matt Nelson has, is to make sure that the people he reaches out to are joined to Christ. Brother? Thank you, John. Are we allowed to interact a little bit? You can't enjoy it. It's up to your own parents. <laughs> I don't mind if you interrupt me and ask questions or whatever, whatever you'd like to do. Are we sharing opinions or not? Uh, whatever you want. Why not? <laughs> We're not in the sanctuary today, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, my, my name is Matt Melton. I, uh, I have a wife and two children. We have an eight, 18 year old son, so pray for me. <laughs> 13 year old daughter. <laughs> my daughter just rolls her eyes at me right now. <laughs> Don't worry, that'll years. change for the worse. <laughs> my son uh, is going to leave Tybee this uh, summer. And go to Laterno University. Anybody know Laterno? Longview. Yeah, over in Longview. So, yeah, my son is the, the polytechnical mechanical person. I'm like the artist, you know, the theologian. I don't know anything about that stuff. But he's going to be a pilot. That's the plan. And uh, my daughter is only 13, so I could pray for her. Matt comes from a very I'd say well-known family in Houston, Texas. We have commonalities there that we didn't know we do, but we do. And um, he's from Houston. I do. Yeah, I grew up in Houston. And we, his family used the funeral home where I was president. It's sort of the commonality. I know that seems strange to you, but George and Lewis, so that's where his family went. Well, that's not anything to you. I forgot that, but you remember that. I remember that. That most important of all you do is that you all use that funeral home. <laughs> so go ahead. You want an opinion? You got one. Um, I, I work with Peterson Health, uh, mainly as a hospice chaplain. I was talking to a gentleman about that a minute ago. So mainly what I do is I visit people and their families that are on hospice care. I do that uh, four days a week. And um, as if you don't know anything about that, I go to nursing homes, I go to any any place where people are that are on hospice care. Uh, it could be a home in Fredericksburg, it could be a home in Junction, it could be a facility in, um, in Fredericksburg, somewhere like that. So I'm, all, I'm in my car driving around all the time, and uh, I kind of get to minister to everybody, which is kind of unique. You know, I, I, when, you're, when you're a pastor of a church, you have all Baptists or all Anglicans, or, you know. but the ministry I do is to everybody, uh, Christian and non-Christian alike. Yep. So you were you were mentioning that. Um, <clears throat> that is a challenge. And Peterson Hospital is not a church, right? You got to understand that. But not everybody working there is understanding what I'm doing, providing spiritual and emotional support. Um, so I'm kind of like a pastor. But I think I'm more like a missionary, really, the work that I do. Um, I thought I would read one thing from the Bible. We are Christians, right? So we do that. I'm going to read a little from Romans 12. And I think a lot of this has to do with the, the work of the ministry that I do. Paul is uh, talking about spiritual gifts, and then he goes into the marks of a true Christian. He says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil. This is 12.9. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. That's something I get to do every day. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. We all should be doing right. Serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. That's 
very important at end of life. Hope. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in, a, in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. That's one thing that I spend a lot of time doing as well. Praying for people. Praying for families. Contribute to the needs of the saints and, and seek to show hospitality. <clears throat> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. You've heard that verse before. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And then he talks about <clears throat> getting revenge and how we shouldn't be getting revenge. He says in verse 18, live peaceably with all. And then he ends up saying, if, you're hung if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's kind of another sermon for another day. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'll read that last line. Time. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that, that's kind of the work that I do, is trying to do redemptive work with people that are at end of life. Um, <clears throat> You understand the idea? That's, that's the Christian idea of redemption, right? salvation. Um, but God takes our evil and turns it to good. There's even a story at the end of Genesis that talks about Joseph. You know, Joseph was <clears throat> down in Egypt, and his, his brothers come down during the famine, and he was able to feed them. And at the end of Joseph's life, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I think that's, that's one thing that I... Kind of, kind of sum up all the ministry that I do with redemptive work. That's that's what we're after. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you a couple of stories. I uh, right now I'm working with a gentleman, and uh, he lives out of town on a ranch. And I visit this gentleman. We'll just call his name Lester. Lester lives out uh, on a ranch, and he was a former Marine. He was in the Marines. And at one point in his life, he got in a truck wreck, and he lost the use of his legs. So he's in a wheelchair. And he also deals with wild game and hunting. <clears throat> he sells wild animals, things like that. And uh, somehow he got gored by a bull. <laughs> By a horn, so he's got he's got wound care going on for this wound. He's in a wheelchair. Um, he has a, a history of drug use, um, so he's not a 95 year old man. Well, he's a younger man in his 50s, but he's on hospice care. And uh, I get to visit uh, Lester at his ranch, and um, it, it's interesting ministry. He's not involved with the church. Uh, in his bedroom, there's a big Bible sitting by, by, by the bed. I'm not sure how, how often he reads the Bible. But uh, he's having visions of shadow people. I don't know a lot about shadow people. Do you know anything about Never that? Heard. Never heard that? No. Has anyone heard that phrase before? I'm, I'm seeing shadow people. So <laughs> the people that I work with, like the nurses, the social worker, they're like, Chaplain, what is that? <laughs> like, I don't know what that is, you know. <clears throat> but something psychological, something spiritual, something emotional, something maybe having to do with, with the drug use that he used to do. <clears throat> but anyway, um, one of the jobs that I have with Lester is to, to bring in peace, right? To bring, to bring uh, hope for the future. So I read scripture with him. Uh, the last time I went up there, I read him from Ephesians chapter 6 about putting on the full armor of God. Because I, I don't know if there's something demonic going on. I don't, I don't know that, but there might be. Or it might just be psychological. But he's bothered by these shadows of these, of these people. What's that? Real to him. It's real to him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're all baffled over at Peterson. We don't know exactly what's happening. I know I can pray for him, and I know I can read scripture, and I know I can listen to him. Um, do I have all the answers for Lester? No, I don't. But uh, 
I think my job is to, to bring him peace with God, to bring him hope for the future, talk about heaven with him. <clears throat> and he would tell you he's a he's a professing Christian. So thank God for that. Um, I don't know his heart, however. Um, but he's he's kind of an exception. So uh, let me tell you another story about a somebody who's a little more common than I saw, a lady named Hazel. And uh, Hazel had a loving family, but Hazel was uh, in her 90s and at 220 Harper. I don't know if you guys know 220 Harper. It's a little, <laughs> a little house that Brenda runs over there. I don't know her last name. But uh, this is more of a typical type hospice situation. Um, Hazel with her family and uh, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all checking in on her and those kind of things. She, she was an Episcopalian by background. So uh, I, I tend to read and pray things that are familiar to her in her tradition, right? And this, this is very different than working with Lester, right? This is someone who grew up in the church, understand, you know, she can sing the old hymns out of the hymn book and all that kind of thing. That's the more common type of person that I deal with on hospice care. Um, does that mean that she doesn't have troubles and problems and visions and she could have those too? But it's just much more of a, it's kind of in, within my comfort zone to work with her <laughs> rather than to work with a guy like Lester. Um, but at the end of her life, she didn't have a pastor because the church where she attended was you know, a couple of towns away from here. Um, she moved here living in a nursing home. So I got to officiate her funeral. And uh, she had her her, children, her daughter there, and her grandson from New York was there. I got to, to minister to him. Um, just pretty unique opportunity. They, Hazel was not in my church. Hazel's not a part of my denomination. But she needed someone to provide uh, funeral care and service for her. So I was able to, you know, to to orchestrate that. We didn't do it in a church. We did it right there at 220 Harper. That's what they wanted. So, um, <clears throat> Two different stories, but it kind of gives you, a, you know, that there's a spectrum, right? When you think of the demographics of Kerrville, um, <clears throat> what my first visit of the day might be um, to a Spanish-speaking only family out in Ingram, and then I might end up the day at the day over in Comanche Trace, you know, talking to someone who's have been a businessman or a businesswoman or just a full spectrum, you know, uh, financially, socially, uh, demographically. So it's an interesting job. Um, and I've done that about nine years over a few years in hospice. <coughs> Are there any questions uh, as I'm talking that you, you wonder about? Or, yeah, yes, of course. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm <coughs> primarily interested <coughs> Conversations you have with people who don't know Christ, yes, and those conversations and how they go over time, as you try to pull them across the line. That's my phrase. Yeah, pull them across the yeah. line so that they don't die without Christ. Yeah, I don't have a formula for you. All right, Just, um, well, I'll start with an easy case. So I'm on call at the hospital, and uh, one night in ICU, I got a call. There's a gentleman who's dying in ICU, and uh, they call me in. This is this is on-call work, so not, not really hospice work. It's just something extra that I do. Um, and I walked in. The first thing the guy, he looks at me, sees my chap, chap like that, and he says, I need to get right with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was an easy case, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do, I just open them up to Ephesians 2 and talk about how we were dead in our sins, and God made us alive in Christ, and that we've been saved, but not by good works, but by grace through faith, and lead him in prayer, you know, and talk about salvation. It, it was like a, you know, like a ripe apple right there yeah. for the taking. Yeah. Now, that's not the normal situation. Um, the difficult ones are when someone, well, a lot, a lot of the difficult ones, they don't want a chaplain, so I don't even get to go. So. If someone's maybe like antagonistic or atheist or something like that, they're going to decline chaplains because they don't want they don't want me coming to get involved with their 
situation. However, should, should we be praying for them to, as we develop a prayer cycle here for you, and yeah. what you yeah. do, yeah. which is the aim of this, should we be praying for those who, is that part of what we should be praying for, those who don't want the chaplain for their heart to be strangely warmed, as Wesley said, open yeah. the door to let you in? Yeah, so if, yeah, if, I'm, if I've got a closed door and I, I can't even get in the, in the house or get in the room with them, so you can pray for that open doors. That, that's where the kind of the missionary spirit is. Um, but there are people that I that I get to go and, and minister to that are not Christian. They might be another, another denomination or involved with something like a cult or something different um, or nothing at all. And I do get to, to minister to people like that. Now those, you almost have to go case by case. What I typically will do is, is I want to hear them tell me about their journey. What has been your spiritual journey? Well, I got hurt by the Catholic Church when I was younger, and I got wounded by this uncle with this thing. You know. And there's a journey, there's a story, and there's a reason why they're not in the church, there's a reason why they're far from God. And I, everybody's got a reason, they've got a story. Sometimes wounding, sometimes... You know, yeah. I, I went to an Ivy League school and I lost my faith or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of reasons why people sure. want to keep God at a distance. I've been, uh, I lost my son in a car accident. Not, you know, so why would God let that happen? Yeah, why would that happen? <coughs> so you talk to them about all that, work through it with them? Yeah, so <clears throat> a little bit of that is like apologetic work, you know, mm -hmm. providing a defense for the faith. But... Basically, it's I need the Holy Spirit to be present and ministering to this person. That that's more important, really, than me having all the right answers for them. Um, I think salvation is something that the Holy Spirit does, not not the chaplain. Yeah. Yes. Are hospital staff allowed to minister to people that might begin something, and then they would call you in? Uh, yeah, that depends on the on the hospital staff person. Yeah, there are. We have a number of nurses that I work with, and social workers that are professing Christians that are involved in all the churches that will even pray with people. Mm -hmm. um, even the doctor that I work with, Doctor Young, he's been known to pray with people pretty commonly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've had that, that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So the doctor and the nurse, they can they can minister to people or help people spiritually. Um, it's not like it's, you know, uh, outlawed or something. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, there are things in our government that you kind of wonder about. Yes. You say you've been doing this for nine years. What toll does that take on you yeah. when you're dealing nine years day in and day yeah. out with people dying? Yeah, pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope I'm not calloused or numbed or hard, you know, hardened to it. Um, but I never thought I was going to be a chaplain. I thought I was going to be a pastor. And, uh, you know, God has a way of kind of redirecting your path sometimes and putting, it, putting you where he wants you to be rather than where you want to be. He has a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, his plan is not my plan. Oh, right. yeah. His ways are above my ways. Yes, yeah. sir. I was just going to mention that not many of us have a, an opportunity. And I had an opportunity. A friend of mine, a veteran, served in, during the landing in France. Yeah, Normandy. He went over on the Freedom Flight. When he came home, he was sick. And he was in intensive care at Sid Peterson. I went to visit him. He said, John, I've never been baptized. So our pastor here was a 19-year chaplain in the Army. Mm -hmm. So he volunteered to go up to uh, where he was recovering after being in the hospital. We got him baptized. He came in in uniform with this flask filled with water. Not a, the thing, the reason I'm bringing it up is 
not many of us have that opportunity like you do right almost every day yeah, yeah you know it's fun to go to a wedding but uh, when you go to funerals people really have your you really have their attention mm -hmm. and you can you can really talk to them about eternity and things that are not temporal like heaven and forever and things like that <clears throat> so uh i don't really enjoy funerals but it, god has a God has a way of working through death and funerals to, to get people's attention. I think that is true. I have done baptisms for people. Um, I don't really, I don't really promote that, but sometimes people will say, you know, before I die, I, I, met, I don't know if I really understood that baptism. Could, could you come in and, you know, we're not going to dunk them in the river or anything, but, you know, sprinkle. And I, I don't. My theology is that. God saves people, the Holy Spirit, Jesus saves people, not the baptism. But there's different denominations of belief in it. Yes? How do you talk to someone who doesn't want to hear about the church? Let's say, well, we'll see things. Yeah, that, that's kind of a hard one. Yeah. <clears throat> because I'm, I, lo I love the church. Um, Jesus said, you know, I will build my church, but the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus loved the church, he still loves the church. Um, but as Americans, I don't think we love the church very well, <clears throat> and we're definitely headed the wrong direction as far as yeah. involvement. Um, but, however, I mean, I, I just been looking at the revivals and things that are going on in college campuses. <clears throat> God's done that before, right? The First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, the Layman's Prayer Revival. There's always historically, you can look back and see God working. Sometimes when things get pretty rough, then, then God uh, brings Holy Spirit revival. So we can pray for that, right? Mm -hmm. Revival among the the nation, and then maybe renewal in the churches. Our churches yes. need renewal. Um, just wondering how many how many people have the word. Um, I think every day. I have some kind of chance to to say something about the gospel, about good news, about salvation, about how God hasn't left us in our sins. He's provided a, a solution to the problem of sin to bring us back together to reconcile. I mean, there's a, a thousand ways you can talk about the gospel, and uh, I get to kind of be kind of creative with that with people. Uh, but I typically do it in the context of their story, letting them <clears throat> let them tell their impression of what God is doing at the end of their life and what God has done, and then try to try to take those pieces and put it together into some kind of beautiful tapestry puzzle type thing at the end of life. Yes, yeah, so I get a lot of opportunity. Do I get an opportunity to do like a three-point sermon and a poem? No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I get opportunity to show the parts, you know. But just to see the joy. Yeah. And you can do that by reading the scripture with people. You know, taking them to Romans or Ephesians or Galatians. Something that's going to be focused on the gospel. Like the good news about Jesus and grace and faith. And then you can also do it by praying for people. You can pray theologically for people. Pray apologetically for people. Like trying to Help them to understand what God has done. Not so much what they're doing for God, but what God has done for them. Does that make sense? Like the finished work of Christ for salvation. Let's talk about that. Let's pray about that. Not about how good and church going you are. Because we all we all kind of fall short in that area. In, yes, sir. In the context of, of hospice, how many people do you are still, are, and, they're, and they would be believers, but they're, they're still looking for healing. Yeah. And, and, and hoping for healing. At the very end. At the very yeah. end. And, yes. and, and, and the personal experience that, 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 I, that I watched the course of that go. Yeah. But it, it uh, the question is, how often do you? Yeah. You run into that. Um, there are churches and denominations and groups of people that healing is a major part of their theology. 
And uh, mm -hmm. there are people that are not even connected to churches that have this view that <clears throat> God is always going to heal them. And uh, theologically, I mean, if we, we know that we all have <clears throat> a life here. We die. Our soul, our soul <coughs> is on God. Like, we believe in historic, you know, the creedal church, the doctrines of the church. Not everybody has read those or believes those. So, <clears throat> yeah, we, we have people all the time that I'll, I'll meet them the first time and I'll say, how can I pray for you? And they say, pray that God heals me. You know, it's the first thing out of their mouth. Do people understand? And they, they could have sorry, a terminal cancer with meds. They yeah. could have major things going on, but they're, they're not giving up that God's going to heal them. But do they understand that the ultimate healing is eternal life, and that being here, you know, I said earlier today, yeah. and this is not being healed here on earth is not the That's a very good not point. the ultimate healing or the best healing. Yeah. Sometimes people have to face the fact that the best healing for yeah. them is to take the next step to be with God in eternal life. Do they yeah. understand that, or they face it and they not they want to have? Are they are they at peace? Some people are at peace, I guess, and some people are not. That, would that be fair to say? Yeah, and some people it takes them a while to kind of come around to the idea that maybe this is the time that God has ordained me to pass away. And maybe it's my time to go to heaven. You know, or, go to the Father's house. Yeah. Um, I, a lot of times for but people... But do you help them understand that? <clears throat> yeah, a lot of times I'll read like Revelation 21 about how in heaven there's going to be no more mourning all things will be for me, for me. Yeah, and and that God is not so much concerned about your eighty-year-old body that's falling apart. He's concerned about your soul, and your spirit, living forever. He's concerned about with him. Well, we wear out. Well, hopefully, Herman, you will heal him. Yeah. <laughs> He's not nauseous. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. 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 brings his suit forever. Get better, get out. It is a joy to talk to people that are Christian that have the hope of heaven. That are What's it going to be like to be you know, face to face with God? To see Abraham, or you know, those kind of stories. It's just fun to dream. We don't we don't know all the answers about where we're going. We we know what's in the Scripture, right? And we know the Revelation and prophetic passages and things like that. But there is kind of a fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. I've never made this journey before. Right. Yes. Yeah. In, yes, in, in our Sunday school class, might have been last week, um, we talked about the uh, 23rd Psalm and the day that I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've always wondered how long are you in that? The main, word, the main word is through the valley. Well, not, through, not, yeah. not staying yeah. in. You don't want to get stuck in that valley. Yeah. Without fear. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. get stuck in there. Yeah. 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 That, that always uh, yeah. uh, made me a little anxious yeah. uh, when I read that, you know. And, uh, but that's but thing, not from the John said, person. you know, Jesus is with you. He's got you by the that's hand. That's what it says, right? He's you through there. And, you're stuck uh, there. You're only there for like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I've got comfort in that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all have our own, physically, yeah. we all have our own kind of journey that we take. Um, I mean, I, I've had ladies that had like dementia and Alzheimer's for eight years or something. You know? Yeah. It's just a long yeah. slope. But what most people want is, you know, I want to be, I want to go to sleep. I don't want to die. Ideally speaking, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really do that part. But the, you know, the doctor can medicate people to give them pain relief and things like that. Um, are you you're acting like you're getting out? Do I need to say a prayer? Wrap it up. If you want to, you can. I'm not saying. Anyone, one last question, or I have a question. Uh, when. <clears throat> When you go to do hospice, do you have a list of people are you that uh, you just go visit or are you invited to go visit? Or yeah, so the, they have to be on hospice care. 
Uh-huh. Um, so six months. Yeah, Dr. Young will be their doctor. They'll have a nurse. They'll have a social worker. And mm-hmm. if they have accepted a chaplain, <clears throat> if they decline the chaplain, then I don't go at all. Yeah. But the doctor will go and the nurse will go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I'm working with the family too. Um, if the person is like not responsive or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> right. You want to read something challenging before I? Yes, I also want you to make three things that we can add to our prayer list regarding you, yeah. you and what you do and how you go about it that we can pray for from now for a long time. Yeah, I would just say pray, these down, pray for Peterson Health for all the all the different programs that we provide and for the spiritual side of Peter Peterson Health, the chaplains and people that do that work. Um, <clears throat> Pray that we have opportunity to share good news with people. Um, pray for the patients and their families. Like you're saying, if they're if the patients far from God, we need the Holy Spirit to, to intervene. <clears throat> have you all heard of the Fellowship of the Unashamed? Yes. Yes. <laughs> have you ever heard of that? Yes. Yeah. Has anybody not ever heard that? Can I kind of read this? Please. <clears throat> This is one of the most challenging things I've ever read. This is like an anonymous, it's kind of like a prayer. He says, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have stepped over the line. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is in God's hands. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, the bare minimum, smooth knees, <clears throat> colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane walk, t- mundane talking, frivolous living, selfish giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, applause, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, the best, Recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on Christ's presence. I love with patience, live by prayer, and labor with the power of God's grace. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. And my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, <clears throat> hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, spoken of for the cause of the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go on until he comes. Give until I drop. Speak out until I'll know. And work until he stops me. And when he returns for his own, he will have no difficulty recognizing me. My banner is clear. I am part of the fellowship. Can I say a prayer for y'all? God, we do want to serve you, and we want to uh, give our lives to this great mission of heaven and redemption and salvation. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us, fill us, and guide us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Matt, we, we want to give you this honorarium for coming today. We appreciate it. Yes, sir.